scripture today will be Luke 8, 40 through 42, and then 49 through 56. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. And then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. We have the joy this morning of welcoming some new families to our fellowship here at the Broken Arrow Church. And uh, you may have noticed in the bulletin some joyful news that last Sunday morning after our worship service, Pasha Long was baptized into Jesus Christ. And so we want to welcome Pasha and uh, her daughters, Kaya, Hayden, and Charlie. And if you're here this morning, would you please stand for just a second so everyone can see where you are? Is Pasha here this morning? And the girls? Ah, back here. I'm sorry, I didn't see you back there. We are so thrilled with uh, your decision to commit your life to, to Jesus Christ, Pasha. And we just welcome you and, and your children into our family here. Thank you very much. And we also learned this morning, although you won't find their uh, contact information in today's bulletin, we'll print that next week, but uh, Joe and Vicki Kelly let us know this morning that they want to make this their church home as well. They're coming to us from the 10th and Rockford congregation. They're the parents of Tara Ryan. And Joe and Vicki, where are you guys? Right back here. Would you stand up for just a second, please, Joe and Vicki? Thank you very much. We welcome you as well and look forward to working with you and, and worshiping together and uh, fulfilling the will of God for this church. You'll notice in the bulletin an announcement about the launching of the Friend Speak ministry, and that's going to begin on uh, Saturday. Did I put it down here? I didn't put the date later uh, in. Uh, it's going to be launched on Wednesday, September the 26th, but it's the other date that I was looking for, Saturday, September the 15th from 9 to 11 in the fellowship hall is going to be an orientation and training for this ministry. Back maybe a year or so ago, we talked about this ministry. We had a training seminar and it's been in the works since then. And we're excited that this is about to be launched. Friends Speak is the domestic version of the Let's Start Talking ministry with which many of you are familiar. It's a way that we can reach out to our international neighbors. We can assist them with their conversational English, all by doing exactly what we've been doing on Sunday mornings, and that's studying from the book of Luke. Uh, the Friend Speak program is based on readings that uh, the, the reader and the leader share together and discuss and answer questions about. And so we have an opportunity to help them with something very, very practical, which are their English skills, but in doing so, we get to share the word of God with them, and we get them into this building. And so if you would be interested in that, please mark on your calendars Saturday, September the 15th from 9 to 11 in the Fellowship Hall. In our discussion last week from the Gospel of Luke, we saw Jesus and his disciples in a boat going across the Sea of Galilee to the opposite side of the lake from Capernaum. And this was had them headed toward Gentile territory, to the region of the Decapolis, this league of ten Greek cities. And on the way, one of the Gospels tells us that they left in the evening, so this is a nighttime crossing, and as is prone to happen on the lake of Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee, this storm just burst upon them. And even seasoned fishermen and seasoned sailors 
like Peter and Andrew and James and John are fearful for their lives because the boat is being swamped. Jesus is sound asleep in, in the stern of the boat. And so they wake him because of faith in who he is. We noticed last week that, that fishermen don't wake, uh, awaken carpenters for sailing advice. Uh, they understood that they had done everything that was possible, and yet they still thought they were going to perish. But they probably couldn't have dreamed that Jesus was going to address the situation like he did. That with just a couple of words in the Greek text, three words in our English text, hush or quiet, be still, the storm just disappears. Had they had weather radar in that day, it would have just vanished from the screen. And Jesus asked them where their faith was. He didn't accuse them of not having any. He just said, where is it? And while they had been afraid of the storm, now they are fearful and in awe of him. And we notice when they arrived at the, in, the encounter with this man who was possessed by a legion, by a brigade, we would use the term today probably about the same number of, of soldiers uh, are, are in a brigade as we're in a legion. But we saw this terrible state of, of torment and torture that this man had been in, living among the tombs, crying out day and night, gashing himself with stones, naked, probably covered with dirt and grime and dried blood and healing wounds. And yet the, the one who had control over the storm also has authority and control over the demons that torment this man. And at their request, he allows them to go into this herd of 2,000 swine that are drowned in the sea. The people of the region become fearful and ask Jesus to leave. And I have to believe Jesus knows before they leave Capernaum and head to the Decapolis, I think he knows exactly what's going to happen. Because they get in the boat and they head back toward Capernaum immediately after this happens. It's worth going across the lake for the sake of one man to deliver him, to release him, to save him, to restore sanity and health. And for the sake of one man, Jesus goes. But he never stays where he's not welcome. And he acquiesces to this request that, that he please leave. The man understandably wants to go with Jesus, but Jesus has greater plans for him. He needs a missionary. He needs a Gentile missionary in this Gentile region. And so he says, you go to your own people and you tell them how the Lord had mercy on you and what great things he has done for you. And so our text this morning that, that Braden read for us picks up with the return back on the other side of the lake from which they had come. And the people are excited when they get there because they have been waiting and they are anxious for him to get back. And among the anxious, anxious crowd is a man named Jairus who is a synagogue official. That means that he was a part of the local group of elders that oversaw the workings of, of the synagogue. The synagogue service itself was pretty much etched in stone, not because of the law, but by their traditions. There were memorized prayers that were recited at the beginning of the synagogue service and at the end and in between. There was always a reading from the, the law and a reading from the prophets and then exposition that was offered in response to those readings. There were psalms from the book of Psalms that were sung in that service. So there wasn't a lot to do as far as putting together a service, but slots had to be filled. Readers had to be chosen. Psalms had to be selected. Local matters within the community, since the synagogue wasn't just the religious center of the community, it was the cultural center, it was the social center of the community as well. And so Jairus would have been a man who had quite some standing in the community, held in high esteem. He would have been a, an opinion leader among the people. So what Jairus thought and what he said and what he did had an influence on a lot of people. And here he is, either on his knees or on his face, at the feet of Jesus, not politely asking, he's begging, imploring Jesus to come to his house. Now back in chapter 7, we saw a Pharisee named Simon take some risks. He put some things on the line as far as his reputation and his standing with his fellow Pharisees by inviting this controversial, divisive figure, Jesus, 
into his house. He was willing to run that risk, and for all of Simon's spiritual immaturity and arrogance about thinking he didn't have much to be forgiven of, give Simon credit for that. That he would go against the grain. He would go against the tide of his sect and invite Jesus into his home. That was so risky because we learn in John chapter 9, verse 22, that the Jews had agreed that if anyone confessed Jesus was the Christ, they would be cast out of the synagogue. John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43, many of the rulers believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Simon says, I don't care, I'm inviting him anyway. And Jairus doesn't care. He's a leader of the synagogue, he's an official, and whether he is ever allowed into another synagogue service or not, no longer matters. Because there's something much more important to him. Why was he willing to put all of this standing and status at risk? What would a father not risk for his little girl? What would a father not lay on the line for his daughter? A 12-year-old girl who's extremely ill and near the point of death. I don't know if you noticed or not, in, in Luke chapter 8, verse 42, it mentions that this was his only daughter. Monogenes. Unique, one of a kind, one and only, only begotten. This is a one-child family. For 12 years, their lives have been filled with light and joy because of what this girl has, has brought into their lives. And now, he's so close to losing her. In Mark 5, 23, the parallel passage that, that we find in Mark, we're, we're actually told the words that he says. Luke just describes him falling down in front of Jesus and begging him to come to his house. Mark says, this is what he said. My little daughter my little girl is at the point of death but if you will come and, and lay hands on her she will get well and she will live at 12 years old she was his little girl just like at 22 years old she would be his little girl at 42 she would be his little girl your little girl is always your little girl Say what you will about cultures in the past or cultures present where women have not been as valued as they, they should be, and even there you will find this incredible bond between parent and child, between father and daughter. And then Luke says, verse 42, as he went. Notice there's no explicit statement of Jesus saying, let me consider your request. Let me check my schedule. Let me see what else needs to be done today. And after considering, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an answer. Jesus just instinctively goes. Neither we nor Luke could imagine Jesus doing anything else, and so he doesn't bother to tell us that Jesus assents to the request, that he tells him he will go with him. I haven't always responded so graciously. I haven't always responded so consistently to requests for help. And many times I've regretted that. Jesus just goes. And that's where we read about this aside that I, I didn't have Braden read. We'll read it together now. I wanted to focus on, on the story of Jairus' daughter, but Luke tells us something now that happens as he was going, happens on the way. So let's pick up reading in verse 43. And a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years, could not be healed by anyone, came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus said, who is the one who touched me? While they were all denying, denying it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone did touch me, for I was aware that power had gone out of me. When the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before him and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. 
And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Among the crowd that is pressing so close to Jesus as they're making their way from the seaside to Jairus' house, among that crowd is this woman who has suffered much. Not for a few weeks, not for a few months, not for a couple of years. She has suffered for over a decade. We're assuming that this is some kind of gynecological disorder, this persistent bleeding that she had. And you can understand that the physical impact of such a disorder, because of the constant loss of blood, there would have been weakness, there would have been discomfort. But on top of that, there is ceremonial uncleanness that is associated with such bleeding. She would have been barred from social contact with others for 12 years. We saw last week this this terrorized, tormented, demon-possessed man and how lonely his life must have been. People tried, the only time people got close to him was to try to put chains and shackles on him. This woman was forced to live in isolation as well. She hadn't only lost her health, Mark tells us that she had lost all of her wealth. Mark chapter 5 verse 26, she had endured much at the hands of many physicians. And you just fill in the blanks. Given the the knowledge of medicine at the time, given the cures that might have been attempted for her healing, She had endured much at the hand of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but had only rather grown worse. Have you ever been there? Doctor after doctor, money upon money, and nothing seems to get better. It just persists. She had seen all these doctors, she had spent all that she had, and rather than getting better, she had actually gotten worse. I don't think it's an accident that Luke doesn't tell us that, because he's a doctor. And that would somewhat impugn his profession to acknowledge that, yeah, she saw all these doctors, she gave them all this money, they couldn't do anything for her. Doctors don't want to tell you that. So Luke just says that no one could do anything for her. I'm sure you can identify with this woman's desperation if you or someone you love has has suffered some chronic condition that doesn't seem to improve regardless of the number of doctors that have been consulted, regardless of the amount of money that has been spent. But like Jairus, she has faith. Now understand Jairus has faith. And he knows what that might cost him, being cast out of the synagogue. He has faith in Jesus that if you'll come, things will change. This woman has faith in Jesus. So much faith that she doesn't even want to interrupt him. She doesn't even want to slow him down. But Matthew and Mark record for us her thinking. She thinks, if I can only touch him, I will get well. And so based on this line of thinking, she approaches Jesus, probably from behind, touches the fringe of his garment. Most outer garments among the Jews had the the tassels on all four corners of the outer garment, tassels that are described in the Old Testament. Would have been totally imperceptible physically. It'd be like you being wrapped up in a big parka in the wintertime and you got a scarf wrapped around your neck and you've got the end of the scarf thrown over your shoulder and somebody just brushes two or three tassels on the end of the scarf. Can you feel that? I can't feel that. You wouldn't be able to feel that. No man or woman would be able to feel that. But Jesus knows. Luke says immediately, and we started studying Mark in the 40s class this morning, and and immediately it was one of Mark's favorite words. Luke uses it here as well. Immediately the bleeding stopped. Mark says immediately the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. No debate within her about, you know, I 
think I might be starting to feel a little better. It's been 12 years. She knows. It's like daylight and dark. It's not gradually getting your strength back after a few weeks of bed rest. She is healed, and she knows that she is completely healed of her affliction. And Jesus asked, who is the one who touched me? And Peter, and probably the other disciples as well, are up to their usual misunderstanding, second-guessing selves. And you can almost hear the agitation and impatience with Jesus in the voice of Peter. Understand, they just saw a hurricane disappear out on the lake. They saw 2,000 pig carcasses floating in the lake, driven there by, by demons. And he still wants to get impatient with Jesus. He still wants to get a little agitated, second guess him, be a little sarcastic, and say, Master, the people are crowding and pressing you. And you ask, who touched me? Lord, who isn't touching you? No, you knucklehead, Jesus probably thought. I'm not talking about that. Somebody touched me. Not a casual touch, not an inadvertent or incidental bump. Now understand that, that when she touched him and power came from him, Jesus' power was not some sort of impersonal force or energy. It was only exercised by his will. The power of Jesus wasn't like touching an electric fence. I can tell you some stories about that. I'll save those for another time. But I, I have two or three memorable experiences with electric fences. The, the fence doesn't have to exert its will and say, I think I'll shock you. You just get the jolt. You know, it, it shakes you to your, um, to your shoes. You feel it in your teeth. And it's not that, you know, he's at 100% and he feels this power drain. You know, he loses some bars and it goes down to about 78%. And he tries to figure out what's happened. Walter Liefeld re writes... This doesn't mean that Jesus' power was thereby diminished as though it were some consumable commodity that he would have to recharge for to get, get back up to full power. Jesus has faith radar. Jesus can sense faith. Even before anybody says anything, even before anyone does anything, what this woman did was no mystery to him. Her identity was no mystery to him. So why does he ask? Her story was important. He permitted her to be healed as a conscious act of his will, not some accidental or unintended burst of divine healing power. power. And so his, his question isn't for his benefit. Somebody tell me who did that. It's for the woman's benefit and for the benefit of the crowd. It only took me, I don't know, five or six seconds to read that she came trembling and fell before him and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. It doesn't take very long to read. I imagine it probably took a while to tell. You know, he told the, the demon-possessed man, formerly demon-possessed man, go to your own people, tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And the next time Jesus comes into that region, people are ready to... To receive him. On Wednesday nights this summer, we were blessed with hearing stories of faith, testimonies of faith about God working in people's lives. Jesus wants the crowd to know what has happened, and so she tells the people about the last 12 years, about the pain, about the discomfort, about the weakness. And she explains why she came up and touched the tassel of his garment. And she explains how she has been healed. And so Jesus very tenderly and compassionately says to a woman who's probably older than him, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Such tenderness and such compassion. What we probably would have viewed as an unneeded interruption at a very critical time, Jesus views as an opportunity. But among those who is probably growing a little impatient is Jairus because time is wasting. 
time is of the essence. She is critically ill. She is at the point of death. And we're sitting here listening to this woman tell her story. And it says that while Jesus is still talking with her, someone comes with the news, Jairus, your daughter, has died. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. And we want to move on to the rest of the story and, and, and how she ra she's raised. But Jairus gets the news that nobody wants to get. He gets the phone call that, that nobody wants to get. It's not supposed to happen that way. Not your child. Not your 12-year-old child. But the people say, she's dead, and so don't trouble the, the teacher anymore. Why is it that we so often want to sell God short and sell his power short? because of some circumstances that, that truly may seem dire, but we get to the point where we say, you know, what's the point? It's no use now. It's, it's too late. This problem is too big. This sin is too bad. I'm too far gone. There's no need to pray about it. There's no need to take it to our God. No need to trouble the teacher anymore. And we rob ourselves of divine aid and, and divine assistance. 1 Peter 5, 7 urges us to cast all of our anxieties upon him because he cares for us. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Be anxious for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This connection between prayer and, and peace. And James's admonition in chapter 4, verse 2, You do not have because... You do not ask. They mistakenly thought that death is where the line is. Death is where the line is drawn that separates things that God can do something about and things where God has no ability to intervene. But Jesus isn't troubled by the news. Unlike Jairus, who's got a thousand things running through his mind right now. Jesus just tells him, don't be afraid, only believe. He already believes. He's like the man we're going to consider a little later. I do believe. Help my unbelief. But to demonstrate to us now that we have nothing to fear in death, to help us understand that death is not terminal, Jesus proceeds on to the house. Death is not an undefeatable master. And when they arrive at the house and Jesus sees the mourners and those who are lamenting legitimately and, and genuinely and very understandably why all these people are crying. Grief does funny things to us. We can go from, from tears to laughter in an instant. And they do as well when they hear Jesus mention that she's not really dead. She's only asleep. Their tears temporarily are, are turned to laughter. By sleep, Jesus didn't mean that she was only comatose. She was clinically dead. She was dead by biblical definition. Her spirit had departed from her body because later we read about it returning. Sleep is just used as a metaphor for death because of its, imp its impermanence. Sleep is temporary. We wake up. Death, physical death, is temporary. There is life beyond and so, as he does on other occasions, he leaves the larger group of disciples behind. He asks Peter, James, and John to come with him. I think in two weeks on our next Cloud of Witnesses study, on, on our next Life Group Sunday, I, the suggestion was made that we talk about James and John, the Thunder Brothers. I think I'm going to call that Thunder Up. Um, you know, Cloud of Witnesses, Thunder Up, James and John. And so we may be talking more about those two in a couple of weeks. But as he does on the Mount of Transfiguration, as he does in the Garden of Gethsemane, he takes these three inner circle apostles, along with the mother and the father, and he takes her cold hand into his warm hand. And Mark gives us, we talked about this in class, how Mark seems to be writing for a Gentile audience, and so he explains Aramaic terms when he uses them, and Mark gives us the Aramaic words that Jesus said, Talitha kum, which Mark says means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Just like her mom and dad had probably said to her on 
innumerable mornings, little girl get up. Her departed spirit then returns and reanimates her body, and she immediately got up. And again, Luke seems to be pressed for time. He, don't want, he doesn't give us the details of what must have been an incredible emotional scene as they enwrap her in a, in a seemingly unending embrace in the arms of her mother, in the arms of, of her father. And there's so much joy and so much celebration over this restored life that Jesus sees fit to remind them about more mundane things like she should probably give her something to eat, something that they may have just overlooked in their elation over the situation. Despite his primary concern for the soul, Jesus always showed sensitivity to the meeting of physical needs as well. Another instance where we're reminded that this isn't a, an either or, this isn't a choose one to the neglect of the other. Like him, we seek to meet spiritual needs and, and physical needs. But in this instance, as he does elsewhere, Jesus loudly and boldly declares death is not terminal. It's not the end. The spirit returns to God who gave it, and one of these days it will be reunited with a, a resurrection body on that last great day, imperishable, incorruptible, glorious, bearing the image of the heavenly and not the image of the earthly. Lost a good friend last week down at the McDermott Road Church in Plano, Kent Smith. He was one of our first elders. He was a, a golfing buddy. He was just an incredible guy. West Texas cotton farmer who sold the cotton gin and moved to the big city and was a big part of the life of that church for the last, last 13 years. And I got to listen to a lesson that Kent presented a month ago on July 20th, he passed away on uh, the 29th of, of August. And on July 29th, on a Sunday night, he shared a message. The video was on the website, and I knew it was there, but I hadn't, hadn't watched it till about Friday or Saturday. The memorial service was yesterday, and I thought, you know, I need to hear what Kent said a month ago, a month before he died, not knowing that cancer was going to take him within a month. But he talked about assurance and confidence, and he referenced Philippians chapter 1, that to live is Christ and to die is gain, and that he didn't know which way this thing was going to go. Sometimes he seemed, seemed like he was getting better, and other times it seemed like things were getting worse, and he honestly said, it, it doesn't matter to me. I win either way. No way he could know that a month into the future that, that would happen, but can't believe death isn't terminal. Death isn't the end. We'll close by reminding ourselves of the very first verse that Braden read. And as Jesus returned, the people welcomed him, for they had all been waiting for him. Jesus would leave Capernaum, ultimately, for the last time. Jesus would leave Jerusalem, ultimately, for the last time. Jesus would ascend back to the right hand of his father in glory. But he would say, I'll be back. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is returning. The question for us is, are we awaiting anxiously for him to get here? Can we welcome him when he comes? as Jairus so anxiously wanted to welcome him so that life could be brought out of death. If that hope and confidence isn't yours today, we pray that you would make it yours before you leave here, like Pasha did last Sunday morning. Before we left here, she confessed her faith in Jesus Christ. She was united with him in baptism for the forgiveness of her sins. If you need to be united with Christ in baptism this morning? If you need to return to a life of faithful discipleship, if, if like so many in this congregation, you're just, just bearing burdens that need to be brought before the throne of the Father so that peace may come to your heart, we urge you to come while we stand and sing together.